Imagine a vibrant discussion between people that includes both openness and critical thought in the pursuit of truth. The Purchasing Truth Podcast is an experience, a journey, an exploration of the impact that negative messages in politics and the media have on our families, community, society, and nation. Join your hosts, Bill Sterling and Tom Hazard, to discover new concepts and language strategies that will reveal effective ways of establishing truth. This podcast series will tackle current events, leadership challenges, healthcare confusion, integrity in business, and many other areas that affect us all. Gain clarity and understanding of the various truth perspectives. Welcome to Purchasing Truth. Welcome back to Purchasing Truth. I'm Tom Hazard, along with your host, Bill Sterling. And, you know, Bill, there are a lot of things we could talk about today, but it seems there is one sort of aspect or trait that keeps showing up. <laughs> and actually, that's kind of humorous when you learn what we're going to talk about, because we're going to talk about repetition. It keeps showing up. Yes. Did you get that? Yeah. That's yeah, very nice. So yeah. repetition yeah. keeps showing up, and it has a lot of power. So... Uh, on yeah. both sides, I think, right? Yes, yeah, it does. Yeah, when we're when we're uh, uh, messaging things and repeating things, um, uh, the 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 brain's asking the question: Is this true? Is this not true? Is this true? Is this not true? So it's asking. It's trying to reflect upon. Now, if you plant the seed of a thought somewhere. You could come back to that seed and rewater it and it'll grow up again. Everything from uh, uh, beliefs around racism, beliefs around um, uh, certain groups of people doing different things, certain uh, 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 propaganda things from the past you can bring and you can rewater them and they'll grow. It's like, a, you know, it's like an 80 year old seed that sits in the sand and you just water the thing a little bit and it just pops back up and it starts growing again. So when Trump came down the escalator and said, um, they're giving us our worst, the Mexicans, the rapists and their murderers, and they're not sending us our best people. As soon as, as, soon as they, as soon as he started watering that seed, playing the race card is what some people will call it. And or start talking about uh, American exceptionalism or American isolationism, you're really watering that seed or that belief and that repetition makes it come alive and causes the feeling of doubt or skepticism because the repetition asks your brain and your body to assess, is this true? Is this not true? Is this true or is it not true? Even if it's not true, your brain makes it real or possible. So was it possible that there was election fraud in 2016? Well, sure, there was possible. Possible. Was there election meddling? Yes, yes there was messages of the Russians meddling in 2016. They were meddling. Right. Great. That's problematic. Because now you come to 2020, election fraud is now drafting off of that message of meddling and fraud, and the people can't tell the difference between the two different things. And so the president just, today continuing to beat the drums of there was massive fraud, the election was stolen, and, you know, it's not over. And then he says, well, we'll see what happens, right? The uncertainty creeps back in and he keeps everybody oh, on the hook. That's right. The, the feeling, the experience of um, and the messaging of uncertainty this is one of the things that really frustrate me and the feel the, uh, about the need for awareness that's not met with media is they've got to call anticipatory sentences out. Look, the president is using a sales tactic called anticipation. Look, he's doing that thing again. Hey, isn't that interesting? He's using the sales technique called anticipation. 
boy, that causes his listeners and his base to believe him. And you know, that's a powerful languaging technique. And if he re repeats messages of anticipation, it will keep his believers, his voters on the hook. That's interesting how the body does that. Note, notice that's all observable. I didn't judge that. And, you know, it's, it's really good when we want to do or uh, create a belief that we would like people to carry that's true, but it's not so good when there's a belief that is not true. Now, all of a sudden, it just created a line between this is, this is a technique, a languaging technique that he's using, and it is keeping him engaged. It, what you did is you separated right. the truth from what Trump is saying, didn't you? Right. I separated the truth. Anticipation. I will build a great wall is an anticipatory sentence. Not I have built. Now I got to add more uncertainty to it too. If I get elected again, I will finish the wall. You, you barely repaired, you know, a mile. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah, a mile, 20 miles, 50 miles, they didn't do anything. And you threw a bunch of money at it and, and a whole bunch of other people got money and, and it didn't do anything. Yeah. You like how I proportionalized that one, tried to minimize it a mile. I know that wasn't very nice, but no, anyway, no, it was, that's, that's it another was, episode. <laughs> it, that's all, that's, well, it, it, it meets the need for humor because when exaggeration shows up, there's a minimalization that shows up too. Because we're trying to we're trying to work back. This is why this is why I don't do traditional mediation. Traditional mediation is you have two people at these distant places and you get them to make small agreements towards the center. That's called that's a traditional mediation technique. Will you agree to the color of paint on the car? Yes. <laughs> I would like a black one or a red one. Oh, a black one or a red one. How about the leather interior? I'm, I'm making small decisions on my way to the, you know, buy the car. Instead of saying, hey, you have a need for transportation. Which one of these vehicles is going to meet more of your needs? The listener will go like, well, I never thought about it that way. What I'd really like to use the car for is this. Well, these are the ones that we have on this lot. But really, if you want the one that you really want, Here's the one that's going to work for you. And then you take them to the used place or you take them to the new place and say, okay, how's this work with money? And then all of a sudden you're building a trusting relationship with the listener because you're going from the middle out instead of from the out going in. And one of the, one of the things that happens with repetition is you're just trying to get the person or groups of people to make small little taps to the elephant's head to get him to walk in the right direction. I'm just trying to tap them, tap them. Fraud. People said they're fraud. Do you know there's people that are talking about fraud and it's a loop of untruth. Well, and certainly Trump has been singing that whole tune for, you know, five years now. That's correct. He's been singing. He's been, he's been singing for, he's been singing for, uh, you know, um, since the beginning and, He's, this is not, this is not mysterious because if you think back, cause he started the career on birtherism, you know, Barack Obama wasn't born here. Barack Obama was a Muslim. You know, they, they, they looking to stick, stick types of things that were in the person's, the listener's limbic brain. They were trying to get that to stick inside their consciousness and not, um, and not really be an advocate for truth at all. I'm just going to keep the dopamine high. I am going to scare them or I'm going to anger them. Well, and you know, the interesting thing is Trump is nothing if, if not repetitious. And he, like I said earlier, he continues to play his greatest hits of there was massive fraud. The election was stolen all these things. And it's interesting to see people in the media continue to say, where's the evidence? Show us the evidence. Where's the evidence? And where's the evidence is not sticking, even though they're repeating no. it a lot. Yes. It doesn't, it doesn't stick because there's um, 
um, facts are not as important. Uh, facts are not able to be received unless the emotion has been moved off the listener. You have to actually empathize with the listener saying, listen, if you voted for President Trump, we just want, like to acknowledge that you might be voting on some single issues that the Democrats are not going to deliver for you. And we just want to take a moment to honor your vote right now. And in a disappointing way, the challenge is, is that when the votes are counted the way they're counted, that at this time, Vice President Bush, uh, uh, Biden has the votes that he needs. And it will be interesting as Trump voters look to advocate for their issues. Now, I'm, now I said Trump voters advocate for their issues. It's not advocating for Trump anymore. It's advocating for Republican issues. You've got to actually get Trumpism away from the issues because they believe he's the person to do it. He ain't going to do any of their things or very limited. It will look like he's doing their things, but he's really actually not doing their things. And he is not a long-term guy. He's a short-term guy. So he will move the embassy to Jerusalem. And that is a promise. And it was a law that they were supposed to move it. But the long-term consequence of doing that is that it affects the need for trust when, he needs, when the United States needs to get people to the table. It affects trust in the future, as well as respect in the future about agreements and stability, we become an unstable government, which is exactly what we're currently experiencing right now is, is to the world, we look like an unstable government. And that's, we're not gonna, people are not gonna sign up a contract for that. It, it's like, it's like you know, and, and you know this from business, who wants to work with, with another business that's unstable? No, that's risky for sure. Yes. And what's interesting to see on the other side of things, we see the Democrats repeating some messages also that, yes. you know, people are hurting. They need support. Coronavirus relief has been held up since May by the Senate. And right. that those repetitive statements are starting to get traction, too. Because, you know, McConnell is finally, you know, having the Senate work on and negotiate on coronavirus relief because those two senators in runoff elections in Georgia are getting hammered for not providing relief to the voters. They're asking to vote for them. And among yeah. other things, right? Yeah, and that's where it gets disheartening because when people are suffering and you're looking to get something done, and all of a sudden, uh, one of the political parties decides, well, you know what, uh, why don't I just put this corporate bailout in the middle of this relief package for individuals? I'm also going to give a relief package for the primary voters for this voting block. Then what winds up happening is you don't get something that's really effective. You get, you get, uh, you get arm twisting on those sites. Like, what? Why are you? Why are you putting those people in there? And the answer is because those people are voting. Those people are donating to me, and that's why I'm putting them in there. Is that it is a political thing inside of a um, uh, a healthcare issue. I mean, I'm going to say this is going to sound a little weird, but it's like the Republicans have have made some choices, some short-term choices regarding healthcare and the runs that they've taken out of healthcare that regrettably uh, from a long-term standpoint, uh, Americans are just going to be, uh, you know, kind of furious and it's like, no, we're, we're, we're just going to flush the entire system. We're going to a single play, single, single payer thing. It's actually setting Biden up to go like, listen, let's make this all easier on all of us. And let's just do it the easy way. Let's do it the most effective way. Let's run, um, let's start saving some money in healthcare as a nation. You know, I think that we can actually meet the need for stability regarding healthcare. You know what? 
that whole pre-existing condition, let's deal with that in an easier way. Because there's so many people that have got contracted with the coronavirus, there may be, watch this anticipatory sentence, gosh, I hope somebody listens to this that will, will hear this, because this messaging belongs in their narrative. It'll sound something like this, it'll go, Oof, what? out of all the people in America that have been effective that are now have a pre-existing condition that are really uninsurable under the current system. We really want to make right by those people by ensuring all the people that have been affected by coronavirus. So I think the easiest way to do that will be, and then whatever plan they want to call it, it's, you know, and it's a type, they'll call it this, they can't call it single player, but it'll be a type of single players plan that'll work like this and this and this. And then all of a sudden it's like, the, the whole system, you know, can be things, but they've definitely got to rebrand single payer. They got to reband public option. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of new messaging that needs, needs to take place for the change to take place. So. Sure. Well, the other interesting thing is that, you know, I mean, the talk coming back to repetition, I mean, Biden, Biden continues, you know, and he spoke in Georgia for the the, the uh, Senate runoff races this week, and and he talks about the senators Purdue and Loeffler, you know, and talking to the people, letting them know that hey, uh, maybe your senators are just confused. Maybe they think they represent Texas, you know, and which is tying them to this whole failed effort to try to overturn the election. Right. Right. right, um, right. Which is interesting um, because that, that helps get cut out the whole fraud thing. And, and, you know, he talks about how those senators were, you know, were lining up with Trump and completely supporting all of his efforts to overturn the election and and even got to the point where interesting repetition biden said you know they've recounted these votes three times i'm starting to feel like i won georgia three times right, uh, right. but but eventually really landing on um you know giving the power back to the people don't give them an excuse don't let them take away your power Right. Also, friend Warnock, Biden said, will actually fight for you. They won't put Donald Trump first. They won't put themselves first either. They'll put you first, the people of Georgia. So right. very interesting where he's he's setting this up where, you know, really McConnell has been obstructing and the Republican leadership has been obstructing since May more coronavirus relief that people desperately need. And Biden is setting this up to say, hey, your senators and the Republican establishment is not helping you pay your bills. We want to help you keep the lights on and stay in your home. And we can get you that relief if we elect these two Democratic senators. So there's this interesting repetition going on about all that. And I think that the, the whole bit about Purdue and Loeffler, you know, being in lockstep with Trump and not being in lockstep with the Georgia voter is the message that's landing. Would you agree? Uh, I agree with about a third of the message landing. I think a third of the people are hearing it, hearing that pretty clear. The other two thirds might sound like this. <sighs> I'm feeling doubtful and skeptical about the integrity of Laughlin because she chose to do this thing. And because of that, she's not a person of integrity that will best represent the Georgia voter. I feel skeptical about Purdue because it doesn't seem like he really, he's, it seems like that he's just meeting his need for acknowledgement and recognition by saying things that are supportive of Trump. But meanwhile, he's meeting his own need for financial security at the expense of the Georgia voters. 
You Georgia voters have done a wonderful thing here because you're starting to fight for yourselves. Wow. I'm having some thoughts that you can fight, that there's some people here that can fight better than those other two people that are fighting for you. And that's why I'm down here talking about them because it seems like that they're better than those other two. And at least they're going to hear your requests and they're not going to just blindly follow somebody that doesn't meet Georgian's needs. That sounds now, like a powerful message right there. Now, you see, I mean, as I'm cultivating it, your body's going like, oh, yeah, that's actually what's happening. That's actually what it's doing. Boy, that really does feel better. Boy, that is the, the way it's going. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the other two human beings, <laughs> the other two democratic human beings have some challenges to them. It's other people aren't going to like. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. They're going to have some challenges, but it's like you want them to compare the apples and oranges and say, this group over here, there's a, the, the apple is a little war, you know, is a little rotten over here. You may want to just, you know, go with the, you know, the, the, the fruit that you haven't had for a while. I have a couple of oranges right now or, actually have a couple of peaches now that we're talking about Georgia, <laughs> Georgia. Might as well put that fruit in there. Cause it's theirs. Of course, Florida would have been oranges and whatever. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, <laughs> so, well, but, but Bill, as you, as you spoke there, it's, it felt empowering to me. Right. 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 And that I think is a powerful message as well for people yeah. to feel like they have control. They have the ability to control their fate with their vote. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate that. It's that that is the positive empowerment. Now the brain will, and this is where, you know, and you and I've talked about the brilliance of uh, Donald Trump many times here is one of the brilliances that he has is he has the ability to um, uh, speak directly to the limbic part of the brain to either scare the listener or anger the listener into motivation. The two words that he's currently working on is the need for fairness and the need for um, vote integrity or really just identity is really uh, your vote doesn't, you know, doesn't count, uh, which is, you know, kind of an identity fraud thing. So it's going to scare people and it's going to anger people to go and vote and saying these other people, I need to do something about it. And it's going to, and those two, those two needs, fairness and a, you know, an identity, we are in this together. You, I am a victim. You're a victim with me. It's, it's not like you and I haven't seen a hundred movies where the victim fights back against the evil person and then overcomes and the person either gets beaten up or killed at the end. He's just going into that same mindset because it's a lot easier to do that mindset in the movies because you really can't do that mindset in real time because the police office will arrest you. You will go to trial and you will go to jail. <laughs> See, but in the movies, no, 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 you can, you know, the villain gets it in the end and the hero stands over him triumphant. You know, so the messaging of compassion and empathy really can, can take us there in a brand new way. And it'll start to mitigate or reduce these, the repetition messages that are showing up you know, on um, uh, when some because truth is irrelevant. Truth doesn't help us. Truth is a process. You got to find it. The only problem with that is that when one person's saying, we are not looking for truth, we, the process is, how do I get everybody away from truth? There's a, there's a really, really big problem because there's not an accountability piece in the open media landscape. There's not an accountability piece. So somebody can hold a meeting, a 
I think the congressman, uh, uh, congressman, senator of uh, Wisconsin did the other day, Johnson, what was, yeah, he, he, uh, he did one of these uh, things and, you know, he had one person that was the expert and another person that was kind of ranting about how he could not find transparency because he was denied the ask. And it's like, how do you put those, those two things together? Cause they're not truthful. Well, if we're in a court of law, that person has to now have a legal consequence if he lies. But there wasn't, they're under oath, but there was no consequence to the oath that they took. <laughs> so, yeah, and that one's, that one's really upsetting. It's like, yeah, that's, you're, that's you're hard to deal with. No consequence. Yeah. yeah. You're going to jail for perjury. How about that? You're going to lie in front of us. Yeah, you're going, yeah. If, if there's a lie that's come across, if you don't have a piece of paper for what you just said, if you don't have some video, you have an evidence, if that has been vetted, both sides. Yeah. See that guy? Yeah. You're, you're having a that, that changes everything, you know, in the, in a court of law, it's like, you know, you don't lie in here, you know, and if you do, then we're going to hold you to a set of standards. Well, Bill, it's, I'm curious, um, you know, how you mentioned, Trump planted some seeds back in 2015, 2016 that he's, you know, pouring some water on now to, and, and it, it, as a result, the message sticks a little more. If you were the Biden administration, the incoming Biden administration, what kind of seeds might you plant now that would help you down the road in terms of repetition? I would start with, uh, I would go right after uh, election integrity. Start doing that now so we don't have this do right now. repeat right. in four years. A, listen, the first thing I'm going to do is election integrity right now. And we're actually going to make sure this next level of integrity takes place. Not because it hasn't been disproved. But what the and tech, and tech and I am I am going to have a state by state review of a task force for a state by state review of election integrity, and what it will show up with and what the the product will be is something will dis, will uh, will show what the product is be so everybody in the state every citizens can have confidence in it, and that's the first thing I'm going to do is because, you know I don't want any of an American that voted for Donald Trump ever thinking that that there was a fraud and their vote doesn't count. I want to make sure that every Trump voter knows that their vote counted just the same as another American citizen in their state. So I want to make sure everything counts and we're going to do that. Even though he knows that what he is saying can be proven, he still has to take the moment to say, we're going to do something for to counteract the message that you've been given. We're going to do something about that. It's really important. It's, it's the weird thing. It's, it's exactly what Clinton did to the Republicans. What Clinton did to the Republicans, here it comes. The Democrats are running up a budget. They're running up a budget. What Clinton did? He's he balanced the budget. It was the only time the budget was balanced. Our budget, he stood up in front of him, zero. Guess what? Reelected. Because right. he took away their, their stick. He goes, You've been hitting me with the stick. Oh, yeah. I'll I'll take away that stick. He cut the he cut the military. He trimmed up these other things. He 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 looked for all the fat and he got rid of it. Cut, 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 cut. And all of a sudden he got, hey, I have zero budget. We worked together with Condra and we got a zero budget. Guess what? They were flat the next year. They couldn't get him out of there because he went with the argument, not against the argument. Always go, always have compassion for the thing. And if you can do something about it, do something about it. You know, of course. Then well, they- that's powerful. It's interesting. I like the idea of, of Biden continuing to plant the seeds about election integrity because going forward, that's that's going to be very helpful. I think for the nation as a whole, not just that's for right. Democrats. That's right. That's right. right. You've, you, they're claiming they're the they're claiming the Republicans are claiming they know where the fraud is. Wonderful. Show us. 
in, in fact, we're interested. We're going to dig in there to find it, you know, and, and I, what I would do. And if I'm going to give the secret, I'm going to give the secret up. Here's what I would do. Okay. I w- I'll give the secret up right away. Miles would do it. I would have every state governor that every state in the election, every secretary, every one of them do a documentary on how their election works with every county. Here's the person. We interviewed this person. Here's how it was handled. This is where it was. This is what happened. This is a- so every state has a record of how their state did integrity or didn't. Then all of a sudden you can go into things, the the soft spots of here's what Texas did about only having X number of boxes to pick up ballots. And this was, did not make it easy for the voter. And next time around, it'd be a good idea if we did. (laughs) It's like, it's, you know, and you just say, yeah, and here's the ranking each state, you know, here's the ranking. Here's the, here's the easiest state to vote in. Here's the hardest state to vote in. Here's the more, inf- who's the more voter friendly state. Here's the, mo- the, the state that's not as friendly. Here's the, here's the ease that takes place. Here's the ones that are, you know, in other words, just do the, just do the reality check. And then that, and then that can really tend to go better. It, it's, it's kind of, we, we, I think that, and we could pick this up next time too, is that there's a certain sacredness when you follow the truth regarding observation and facts, but you've also got to sell truth. You've got to actually, there's a sacredness in selling truth because there is an integrity that goes with selling truth that I happen to have it. And they kind of have it over there, but not as much as I have it over here. <laughs> Is it easier to purchase truth if you're actually selling truth versus yes. selling, you know, uh, beliefs? That's right. That's right. People will move away from their fixed beliefs if their truth can be sold and say, yeah, it used to be this way, but now it's this way. Tom, you and I used to believe in the past that carrots helped eyesight until we discovered it was propaganda from the <laughs> from the British so that the Germans didn't know that they had radar. I mean, I know that one it, that I, I had that belief. You're right. And it, and it doesn't mean that there's some things, elements in carrots that don't help eyesight. There's some things that are in there, but it's not the tip the proportion that they sold it to us right and then after the war and all of these you know all of the people that lived through it and had babies had children couldn't get them to eat their vegetables like you better eat your vegetables so that you you have you know good eyesight and they all propagated the lie yep propagated it oh my goodness yeah so the sacredness of truth is really uh, the embracing of the process um, and looking at uh, a accusation or a, a things and then put it in pro- uh, put it in the pro- proper proportion of at a scale of one to ten this is a level three truth at a scale of one to ten well it's about a five truth at a scale of one to ten vaccines have a side effects. That part has some truth to it. On a scale of one to 10, they are eight, nine, or 10 effective for each individual. You're going to find anomalies everywhere because we're human beings and there's anomalies to be found. And we got to be careful of our anomalies, not for our anomalies to dominate the space, but we want our, the, the, the overall impact to make a difference balancing safety versus protection and that's wow. where we're, we're moving we're moving next so God, you know that's a great subject to talk about in the future i think there's a lot of truth being purchased around vaccines and anti-vaxxers and all that so that that might be a good one to talk about soon i think so all right uh well this has been great tom great discussion yep thanks i appreciate it all right thanks everybody 
Thank you for listening to this Purchasing Truth podcast. We trust that you have enjoyed this engaging and thought-provoking conversation. Our hope is that you've received value, found clarity, and broadened your truth perspective in this episode. If you did, leave us a review or visit our website, purchasingtruth.com. Join us again for another informative and content-rich discussion here at the Purchasing Truth Podcast. Don't just accept whatever information comes your way. Join the discussion. Discover your own voice. Purchase your own truth.